Welcome to another episode of the Impossible Life Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Surface, and I'm looking across at a man with such a high skill in conversation that the only person he finds worthy of regular discussion with is himself. That's right, friends. The FOMO Navy <laughs> Sioux. <laughs> Garrett Unklebach, a man whose inner monologue will one day be made into scrolls. <laughs> I don't know if that... That's a compliment. It's more of a backhanded compliment. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I just, I thought I laughed and that was sort of the standard. So I decided okay. to just go with it because. Pretty uh, low standard then, I guess. Anyways, uh, I'm getting better at equanimity. I'm not, <laughs> Garrett is like always baiting the hook. And uh, my wife will tell you, I always like, I can't resist a baited hook, man. I'm always like, yeah, I know what you're doing. But I'm still going to play along. And uh, how's that working out for me? Anyways, today's episode is about a massive topic, discipleship. Literally, it is the thing that Jesus gave us in the Great Commission to do, is to go into the world to make disciples. And yet... Are you sure? I thought he said, um, go get people to pray a prayer. Oh, that must have been in uh, 2 Matthew 46, 22. I did not read that, <laughs> so apologies there, G. And we're being facetious, but like on a real note, if, if, if you think about it, if you were going to die, what was, what's the last thing you would say to your family? Like, I've thought about this before. And I would very much instruct my, my wife and my kids in certain things because I'd want to make sure they knew what I, what I thought would be, you know, important for them to go and do. You know, there's practical things like, hey, here's how you log into this account to do that. But there's more important things like big life things like, hey, I want you to remarry. I want you to do the, you know, those types of things. So Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. It's not a surprise to him. And the last thing he says is go and make disciples. And yet here we are in 2024 and I would not say that the church is known for being discipling just across the board. I'm not speaking about any specific local church, but just in general, discipleship seems to be lacking. And you may be like, well, Nick, that's a great opinion. Not just my opinion. There's a company called Barna Research. It's a Christian research organization that provides data and insights on the trends affecting faith, culture, and ministry today. If you ever want to check them out, go to Barna.com. That's B-A-R-N-A. Very, very interesting. And they did the research, so I don't have to uh, have any sort of... Uh, guess about this. This was they took this in uh, December of 2020 all the way through to January of 2021. So they took this survey roughly over a three week period. They found that 39 percent of Christians were not engaged in discipleship, and 39, 39. Hang on, 39 percent were not engaged in discipleship. 33 percent were disciple makers, right? And 62 percent of people were uninterested in discipling someone else. Why? Because they thought it would be too big of a time commitment. Which is basically like, hey, Jesus... Did not understand the assignment. That's, well, that's exactly... It's like, hey, Jesus, I know you said that, but man, that's actually kind of hard. Like, did you know what you were saying? Because I'm pretty busy. I, I mean, it, it's... I don't want to go into, like, negative mode. I want to play on the baseball team, but I don't actually want to play baseball. Right. I just want to I don't. Yeah, I, don't, well, I, I do want to be on the team, but I don't want to show up for practice because that's a lot of work and that, that's a lot yeah. of time. Can I just show up on game day? No, you can't. Like, you really can't. And And... So I don't want to go negative. I just want to walk in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. I don't actually want to. Dude, can I get pinned but just not have to go through buds? <laughs> like, that would be sweet. And, 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 like, we're laughing. But actually, this to me is, like, a real, um, man, it's a shocker, right? And, and, I, and, and I'm not, like, going in on church because people do this in their lives all the time. Everybody wants the reaping, but very few are willing to put in the work of the sowing and, and the nurturing and then preparing it's, their field. It is a reflection of the church, but even more than that, it's a reflection of human nature. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Who who among men is faithful, right? Yeah. Not many. So here's an obvious question for you. If you're listening to this, who are you discipling and who's discipling you? And if you can't answer that, this is a great episode for you. And if you can, this is still a great episode because Garrett uh, was in a fiery mode when I came over to his house today to plan the podcast. And uh, he's fully locked and loaded. Ready to ready to, to bring the heat. So I'm I'm excited to get I think into this. That's with you. Nick's inner monologue. Every time he sees me, he just hears the gun cocking. Sound. No, I don't. You don't know why. I do that partially to poke at you because I know I know you're like it's, there should already be one chamber. Yeah, the gun's already loaded. And the worst thing is now when I'm watching shows with Rian, I say it to her all the time. Like, yeah, this guy's getting ready to go into a dangerous situation and decide that he didn't need to. Have it's a gun. like uh, uh, well, <laughs> Hollywood uses like a gun cocking sound as like increased threat level. Yeah, Bro, exactly. I was already at DefCon Five. There's nothing. There's I can't go any higher. Well, I'm pretty sure every time you got into a combat engagement, you guys yelled a few and insulting things before you actually start shooting. Right? I'll do it. Yeah, just so, just so the other guy had time to cock his weapon and let him know, let, let you know he was serious. <laughs> Anyways, hard left turn there. Okay, so gee, let's... A small shot at B, B action films. I think it's all action films, man. It's, uh, it's, it is sad when I see it in like... 
like high budget action films. I'm like, no, don't. Do, I love that you describe that, that as sad, but it, yeah, it's uh, that's the lot, that's the burden you bear Anywho. as a special operator. Okay, so let's get into discipleship then, man. And the hype, the hallmark of discipleship, G, and what and what describes what discipleship is is what uh, discipleship is what God called us to do, and that's the word disciple means student. It's also uh, in the Greek, it's methates, if you say it right, uh, coming from the core of math. Uh, but what discipleship, I won't go deep into all that, the Greek word, it's not what we want to dive in on today, but discipleship means to be student, right? Right. Jesus didn't, We uh, like Nick said, we're being facetious about it at the beginning, Jesus didn't say his last words on the earth weren't, you know, pray, pray this prayer and get everyone to believe in me, right? Jesus isn't Santa Claus and he only has power if you believe in him. It doesn't work that way. Mm. And he wasn't saying, hey, get everyone to just, let's just get everyone to heaven, Right. right. If that was what life was about, then when, when you prayed the prayer, yeah, you then you, that, yeah, you disappear and go to heaven. That's not what God wants for us. Right. God wants us to mature. God wants us to be like him. And so he said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey my every command. Uh, teach them to become disciples. It says it's meaning teach them to be like me. Yeah. Right. And so to be like Christ isn't just like, I need to learn some more. You have to have someone model it for you. Right. Jesus spoke lots of messages, right? Thousands of people, uh, you know, I don't know what the total number, maybe it's tens of thousands, Yeah. right? But thousands of people heard Jesus's messages. A very small amount of people, there were the 12 that were discipled by him. There were the 70 that Jesus spent more time with, but a small number of people were actually discipled by Jesus where they really learned from him what does it mean to be like him? Yeah. Right. So really what discipleship is, is it's becoming a student. I want to be like Christ. I want my life to look like his. I want to act like he thought, uh, act like he acted. I want to think like he thought. That's what it means to be a disciple. Right. And the hallmark of discipleship is that you said this before on this podcast that you, that the disciple can then go and reproduce. Right? Absolutely. It's um, Jesus said a couple things. One, he said, the poor will always be among you but I won't always be. That was not just an indictment on the poor. That was not Jesus's uh, economic philosophy, right? Yes, the poor will always be there. It's not what he was saying with that statement. He was saying the poor will always be among you. I won't always be. Mm. I'm doing the what you guys are watching me. You guys follow me from town to town. Listen to what I say. Watch me do what I do. Watch me solve problems. Watch me pray for people. Watch me fix issues. You're learning what I do. So the time will come. The poor will always be among you. I won't always be. Mm -hmm. The time will come when I won't be here and it'll be your turn. Yeah, that's so good. Now, um, I mean, and we're going to go into showing where, what this looks like modern day and, and where some of the places it's broken down. Then we're also going to show you God's way of discipleship because there's a clear path and process um, and we'll get into that. But I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of a hint to what the, what's to come. So we know discipleship is God's way. And this is a humbling thought process for you. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Right. Which is like, oh, yeah, of course. But th this is the, in the modern day, this is like, oh, you know, we're not here to follow the pastor. We're here, like people will say that sort of thing. Like, hey, guys, we're not here to worship the pastor. We're here to worship Jesus. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. However. God, God sits on the throne. Right. Oh, we're supposed to be like Christ. Right, but if if Jesus didn't think that the right way for people to be like him, or if Jesus thought the right way for people to be like him was just to read about him, then he would have spent all his time reading books. Yeah, for sure. Right, the disciples recorded what happened with Jesus, what he did, so more people could be like him, and mm -hmm. so that we could teach, so that we could have the word, a foundation of what Christ's life was like, what he did, and what he said. But Jesus gave the mission to the disciples. Yes, you learned from me. Now you go and teach other people. Uh, to have this thought that like, man, I don't need anybody mm -hmm. to, to learn from God. We have the scripture. You need to learn from, you need to learn through the scripture. But you also, like Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And if you read Paul's writings so many, so many times in his letters that he's dealing with the churches, he's trying to remind them, look, I'm not trying to hurt you. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to punish you. I helped establish this church. I'm trying to show you the right way. Right. Right. And so that's what a discipler is going to do in your life. They're going to help you understand it. Discipleship is not a transference of knowledge. Otherwise, you could YouTube your way right. to like being a, a great follower of Christ. And yes, you can learn a lot from messages. But something I say all the time at Mighty Men, right? Like we've got these hundreds of guys that meet every Saturday morning and I get the opportunity uh, to speak with people. I, I invite people up. Hey, if it's your first time, please come up here. I want to meet you. I want to shake your hand. And it, real quickly, you know, because I want to hear from people on who they are, how they got here, give people a chance to tell me their story. 
But something I say to every single person, whether they're, I talk about discipleship, what we believe discipleship is, and I tell them, hey, look, there's way better speakers than me that you can hear online. Mm-hmm. But what you can't do online is have relationship, right. right? We meet in small groups every Saturday. I'll share a short word, and then guys get in groups with other people. And I, I tell them, I believe that rela- discipleship happens through relationship, mm-hmm. right? When you get around other men who can speak into you, who can encourage you, when you can find a leader that you can model your life after, that they'll show you what living like Christ looks like, that's where really you're going to grow, right? Right, Because you can watch way better preachers online. And, and yes, you'll learn some things, but where you learn the most is through relationship. Jesus' life is an example of that. The people who benefited from Jesus the most were the people that spent time with him. Yeah. And I mean, and, and so people will have problems with, with someone like, oh, I'm supposed to imitate this guy. Hang on, that guy's not Jesus. Well, you're right. He's not Jesus, but we see this. God put this into us from a young age. We were born to be followers. Every single child learned how to grow up and be an adult, and walk and talk, and do all the basic stuff because they were following a parent or a guardian. That That is like the picture of discipleship built into us. Well, it's also, think about what you're teaching, right? right. And I'll, I'll zoom out on this. Um, to Like there's some great parallels on this in life. If you quit as a father, if you quit on things, what are you teaching your son? Yeah. You're teaching him to quit. If, yeah, as a father, if someone disrespects you or someone hurts your feelings or whatever, and you say, well, forget those people, I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. You're teaching your children to do the same things. And with discipleship, if you'll never choose to follow anybody, what you're saying is nobody else is worthy of following, mm-hmm. but I should, but I am. I'll right. be worthy of following. What That is a very difficult standard to put upon yourself, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I have my own ideas of what I think a leader is. I have some of my own ideas of what I, I think it means to disciple people. But I have people who are discipling me. I have people who I'm following. One of the things that has helped Lindsay in following me the most is she has watched me follow other people. Right. She's watched me submit on things that, you know what, sometimes I don't 100% agree with. Something, sometimes things I don't 100% like but to say, you know what, I'm submitted to this. I'm mm-hmm. submitted to this group. I'm submitted to this person, and I'm going to follow them. And you know what? I've chosen to follow them. Their life is followable. Their fruit is followable. They, I've already seen so much of their fruit in my own life. And so maybe, just maybe, the things that I don't like are actually for my good. Right. And people who choose not to follow somebody else, it is this dangerous progressive thought of they don't know, but I do. Right. Right. That's it's a it's a disastrous thought process that exists in the world today of everyone else behind me is wrong, but I'm right. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm right mm-hmm. because I'm new. I'm right because I've had thoughts that they haven't had. And it's a very immature thought process that has gotten into Um, the church has gotten into discipleship of of thinking like, man, I don't need somebody else to learn from. I can just learn from God myself. Yeah. And and so you get that. I mean, and that's what modern day discipleship has kind of become is it's like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to look at you and see if I can follow you. Like I'm going to, I'm going to evaluate you. And there is wisdom. It's not that you just want to run off and follow anybody, but like it's this. Well, that's where there's become this focus and what we'll get into this a little bit more later, but then there's become this focus on discipleship. You need all of these tools. You need all these things that can help you read the Bible. You need all these Mm -hmm. things that are going to help you understand, like you need someone to show that stuff to you. But discipleship is not just a, uh, you know, a master's in theology, right? Right. You need more, you need someone who can show it to you. And this is what Jesus life was. The the disciples saw Jesus, uh, mastery level understanding of scripture, just like the Pharisees had, by the way, they had a mastery level understanding of scripture application, very different, right? The Pharisees' application of Scripture versus Christ's application of Scripture are the East from the West, mm-hmm. right? So it's not just about what you know. It's about how you live. Yeah. And how you live is something that you have to learn from a person, not from a book. Yeah, and that's why when Jesus said to the disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, that was like a, oh. You know, it's like saying, hey, unless you can ball like LeBron James, you know, yeah. really you're not a basketball player. And it's like, uh-oh, I'm Dang in trouble. It. Yeah, it's like, hang on. There's a spiritual reality we're talking about. Because so so modern days all like you said is all evaluate you and it's not and I'm kind of like looking for that knowledge transference. Are you, you know, are you worthy of being able to share? Can I learn anything from you? I don't know. Because ultimately you're the boss in that situation. And that that is an individualistic thought process. And this whole like, I can be a Christian at home, I don't need I don't need to go to church to love God. This type of thought process, it's such a subtlety of how mm-hmm. our society has moved from, if you zoom out a couple thousand years ago, if you want to survive, you better get with a tribe. It, w- it wasn't even a question of, do you want to? It was like, you need to be with each other because there's threats all around, and if you're not together, you're going to die. And as we've progressed in society, quote unquote, it's, you can live off in the middle of nowhere on your own, order everything from Amazon, and you don't really need human interaction. 
And people aren't aware of that, of how individualistic you, we are. Hey, you can get your doctorate online. Yeah. And, and so they pull that same thought process into, they, they don't realize that they're always being conditioned. and Because we are, as humans, we're always mm-hmm. being conditioned. And so now we've, we've allowed a subtlety of a, like worldly thinking to come into our faith and be like, well, look, this is logical. Because obviously, remember, my logic is, is the chief thing here. Uh, and I'm saying that sarcastically. It, <laughs> you know, I don't, I, don't need, I don't need to go to church to love God. You, I mean, in theory, what you're saying makes sense to you. But if you're, if loving God means being obedient, then you're absolutely wrong because He has commanded us. Scripture says, "Don't neglect the gathering exactly. of believers." Yeah, and and anyways. and that's really, mo- and that scripture is just about the encouragement and the unification of a body. Right. But we're talking more about discipleship. Like, who's going to teach you to be yeah. like Christ? Yes, the scripture is going to teach that to you. But just knowing the scriptures, you could memorize the Bible, and that won't necessarily mean application for you. Right. Ex- that's exactly right. And so you can you can sit there and be the person who's puffed Perfect. up on knowledge. Great, great example of this. Great example of this is in John chapter eight, where, and right. so this is where the disciples were all, all through Jesus' time. He's he'll speak to them and he'll give messages to them, and there's intimate moments with Jesus and the disciples. But there's also a lot of public moments. Mm-hmm. And in these public moments, the disciples are there, but you don't necessarily see them in Scripture. Right. They're just watching. They're yeah. listening. They're recorded it. Yeah. Right? But you're not really seeing them. You're just seeing Jesus in the moment. But also in your mind, seeing some of these public moments of Christ, the disciples are there watching, and they're yeah. there learning. And in John chapter 8, this is the, uh, the woman caught in adultery. Mm-hmm. And the Pharisees bring this person to Jesus, and they say, the law of Moses says that we should stone this woman. She's been caught in adultery. And this is the story in the Bible where Jesus begins to, he bends down and he writes in the dirt. Mm-hmm. And no one knows what Jesus is writing. It doesn't say a lot of people, and I would agree with, uh, assume that he's writing the sins of all the people who are the accusers, right? Uh, one by one, all of the people who said, you know, this one was caught in adultery, they leave. Mm-hmm. We don't know what Jesus is writing. But then they're all gone. And Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? Now go and sin no more. Mm. Right, And so the law said stone her, and Jesus didn't follow the law. So if you were just a student of the law, this is a great example, is the Pharisees, they've not learned application from anyone, but they're just the keepers of the right. law. And so what the disciples are, are, they're there, they're watching Jesus do this, and they're asking an important question, well, why? Mm-hmm. Because you're, you're, you're um, the son of God, and God's law says to stone this woman, so why wouldn't you be the authority on this? Shouldn't you be the one to throw the first stone? Right. Yeah. And Jesus says, "He who is without sin, throw the first stone." Yeah. What this te- this is a great example of Jesus getting to really the heart and the spirit of the law. The law isn't like, "Hey, I just want to hurt and punish people." The law is, if you'll follow this, it'll help get you to me. It'll help get you right. to growth and maturity. Yeah. And so, what Jesus wanted more for that woman than for her to be punished was, He said, "Look, you just need to change and st- stop doing this. Now, go and sin no more." Be mature. Stop it. Essentially, mm-hmm. is what Jesus is saying. He, uh, I think that in that moment, he real like this woman was almost stoned to death. Yeah. Right. The only reason she wasn't stoned to death is because Jesus was there that day. Yeah. And so when the Pharisees are bringing, uh, you can just imagine, right? People got stoned to death in that time. And so imagine this woman when she got caught in adultery by the Pharisees and she's being dragged down to the town square. She's imagining herself about oh, to yeah. die. Yeah. Right. And so you don't really see that or feel that pressure in that moment. But if you can try and imagine this what this must have been like for this woman, Jesus could see it on her face. Yeah. She thought she was about to die. She's spared. She feels the mercy of God. And now he says, now go and sin no more. The mo- the, what I'm saying in this is the disciples got to see the way Jesus lived yeah. and the way that he responded. And so it's not always so black and white that the, the disciples are able to, okay, Jesus, why did you really do this? Mm-hmm. And so by spending time with Jesus, more than just what a law said, they're able to see and feel what the heart of God is. Yeah, because they often asked him. One of the things I love about reading through the Gospels is you get these insights when they're like, like when Jesus talks about divorce and how he only allowed them, Moses gave them that decree because of the hardness of their hearts. What's amazing is if you know how common divorce was in the Roman times, it makes sense why the disciples then go in the house and go like, is that, hang on, can you explain that one to us? And they constantly do that. Wait, what did that parable mean? And so you can imagine we got those those. Uh, conversations recorded how many other ones were not recorded right and i can and you can you can also see sometimes when they ask questions it says that they were afraid to ask them because jesus would just like snap back like hey are you really this thick about it are you really this hard hearted that you can't understand this and so you can see how there was this like respect but also this admiration and this awe as they're learning and walking with them and i think it's um i think it's just such a fascinating insight into what it must have been like for them to just go everywhere with him for three years so key point here is yes you've got to learn discipleship and you've got to learn application of the word of right. God. 
because discipleship isn't about knowing what the Bible says. We know what the Bible says so that we can be like Christ. Yeah. Right. That's the end state. And so to learn how to be like Christ, we need someone to show us how to put it into practice. Yeah, that's so good. So um, we're going to think about it this way, just real quick before we move on. It's like I could give you all of these books on marksmanship and about shooting. You would learn more in a day on the range with me than you could ever learn from books. Right. Right. And so when you go out with a teacher, when you go out with someone who has application and mastery in an area, if you go on the range with me, I'll teach you more than you can learn from a book. Yeah. Right. In a very short amount of time. It's great. If you, if you read the book, it'll make our time way more valuable. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm not saying that books are bad. It'll make our time more valuable. But that's what you have to have. You have to have someone show it to you. You can read a book all day about like the fundamentals of a jump shot. Mm-hmm. Right. But then when you get on the court with someone who really knows how to play and can help tweak you a little bit. That's where it'll take what you read to a completely different level. Yeah, big time. Now, now I think a lot of what we talk about with modern day discipleship will make more sense because I want to get into what the, the, the actual process of discipleship is in God's way, G. If you're out there and you're like, man, okay, I'm realizing I don't have someone to disciple me. How do I find somebody to do that? Check out our mentors podcast we recorded a few weeks ago because yes. we talked about how to identify. I think it was this uh, wading through confusion in the world of experts, uh, something like that. I, ideally, a someone who's discipling you is a mentor. Yeah, that's for, ideal. Yeah, they need right. To be so if you've listened you. to that podcast, that makes sense to you. If not, finish this one. You can go back to that. Ideally, someone who's discipling you is a mentor yeah. in your life. All right, you. Let's get into God's way of discipleship. So what's what's first? Um, so. I kind of put this down into four phases of dis- or zones of discipleship, right? And because we, I mean, truly, even even if you don't really know what discipleship is, if you have a heart for God, like you want to be discipled, yeah. where am I at in discipleship? And this is also, I'd say it's hard, this, this is a hard thing to evaluate, but people that you are close with, you can evaluate um, in, a, in a marriage. It's like we can have this conversation and talk about where are we at in, this, in these zones of discipleship. First zone of discipleship, Let's look at Matthew chapter 28, right? Matthew chapter 28 is the last chapter in Matthew. This is the last time that they're with uh, Jesus, and this is really some of the most important scriptures on discipleship. This is where the Great Commission comes from, is Matthew chapter 28. In verse 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. Mm. But some doubted, right? This is in this scripture, right, where they worshipped him, this is the first step of discipleship. Worship isn't just like, I don't know what it means specifically how they worship there. The first time worship is mentioned in scripture is where Abraham says, let's go up to the mountain and worship, meaning Abraham, let's go put you on the altar. Isaac, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Abraham and Isaac. The worship is sacrifice. Worship is mm-hmm. all and reverence. And so, you know, I don't know if they pulled out a, a, an instrument and started playing music there or if they just bowed on, bowed yeah. and got, uh, you know, prostrate and reverent before God or before Jesus in this moment. But the first thing they did is worship him. You have to see the glory of God. You yes. have to um, honor God and see who God is in your life and want more of him. If you don't do that, you're not ready to be discipled. Yeah, very good. This is really what salvation is about. Yes. Right? Salvation baptism. Now you're ready for discipleship. A lot of people think salvation just means like, well, I prayed a prayer, like Mm -hmm. the pastor led me in the prayer. That's great. Right. I love that you prayed that prayer. That means you've got to begin to worship God. Mm -hmm. If you're not worshiping God, if you're not longing for his presence, um, you're not ready to be discipled. This is this. So this is zone one. Zones. Zone one is worship. When I worship God, when I want more of God, when I'm reverent of who God is, I understand his power. I understand the forgiveness that he's given me. That's when I'm ready to move forward in discipleship. Yeah, it, it really is a revelation, and when you see God, right, that you're going to to worship Him because you know it says every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and there there is that pl- made plain moment. But you see this over and over in Scripture, whether it's in Isaiah, whenever he sees God and he goes, "Oh, I'm an unclean, I'm a man of unclean lips," or when Jesus tells the disciples to cast to the other side of the boat and they catch a bunch of fish, and what is what does Peter say? Or at that point, he's Simon. He says, "Away from me, Lord! I'm I'm an unclean man." And it's like when you have this revelation of God, no, Absolutely. One, no one needs to tell you that you're not worthy of them. Your only reaction can be to just to fall down and be like, oh, God. So like I'm, using these, your, yeah. I'm using these scriptures here for starting in verse 16 and 17 as like in uh, the steps of the process. I'm going to go from 17 to 18 mm-hmm. here in just a second. But what Nick is talking about, so this is a process that happens in four verses here. Yeah. But also this is the process of the disciples' relationship yes. with Jesus. Throughout the Nick time. was just talking about where the, the awe, the reverence, the worship mm-hmm. happened 
all throughout their time. Yes. Right. And so I'm just, I'm looking at it here just in this one passage, a few verses in a row as in, as uh, showing what this, these steps look like. But the disciples came to this place of awe and reverence over time through experiences yes. with Jesus before they're really ready to be discipled. Yeah, very good. So moving on from worship, right? And this is where we are. And 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 you're disip- and you're being discipled and the people that you're discipling, right? Someone's not really ready to be discipled if they're not worshiping God. Yeah. Right? That doesn't very mean good. you don't continue to witness to them. You're trying to show them the glory of God. But mm-hmm. they've got to get to where they hunger for God, where they give reverence to God. Yeah. They're going to see you give reverence to God, and that'll do something for them with your children, with your five-year-old, with your six-year-old, this is where you're getting them to. Yes. You're getting them to the worship and reverence yeah. of God, right? That's where you're going to be- begin to be able to disciple them. Uh, zone two is verse 18. So this is now Jesus speaks to them. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So mm-hmm. Jesus is saying, I have all the authority. You, when you're the next step from you worshiping God, this is a big step for Christians, Right, and I'm I'm putting a loose label on Christians of people who just identify mm-hmm. as Christians. Yeah. The next step from I worship God is God's the authority in my life. Yes. And there are a lot of people who self-identify as Christians. They believe in I, oh yeah, I believe in God. Right. I'm you know again, God doesn't need you to believe in Him. Mm-hmm. Right. You believing in Him is not what's important. Right. There's a lot of Christians or people who would identify as Christians saying, oh I believe in God. I go to church. I do all that stuff. But when God is the authority in your life, that means you live by scripture. Yes. Right? Like, mm-hmm. in, and if God, if whatever God said, that's what I'm doing. A lot of people are trying to get God to fit into their lives, right? Like, well, I already have a whole life figured out. I know what I believe. I went to college. I'm educated. I'm already making money. And now I'm doing this whole church thing. And let me see where I can squeeze some of God in. Like, yeah. this whole favor thing the pastor talked about, that sounds really yeah, great. I want that. Um, like I, I need so I got a lot of issues. Like I, healing sounds really good. I want some peace in my life, right? Those things are great. That comes from a relationship yes. with God. But until He's the authority in your life, when you say I want to do it God's way and I'm going to do it God's way, you're not ready to move forward. Along this, with this, once uh, God is the authority in your life, the disciples saw this in Jesus and they made Him the authority. Yeah. They saw they saw like you are the authority. Jesus gives us the opportunity. God gives us the opportunity. He, he sits on the throne, but he allows you to decide, are you going to sit on the throne or are you going to let me sit on the throne, yeah. right, in your own life, right? Not over heaven, but in your own life. God lets us choose him. And so when God is sitting on the throne in your life, that's when you, it's because you're bowing before him. I want more of God in my life. I'm going to follow your ways. And the second part of this in zone two is, uh, again, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I mm-hmm. follow Christ. You've got to choose someone and say, you know what? I'm going to follow this person. Yeah. You're not saying that they're the authority. You're not saying that they're God. God is the authority. Scripture is the authority. But you have to find someone that you can follow, mm-hmm. right? That's what, again, Paul said this over and over to the churches he's working with. He's reminding them, guys, you need to listen to me. Yeah. I established this church. I'm here to help you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help keep you from harm. Yeah. This is spiritual immaturity. This is being a teenager spiritually saying, you know what? I'm 14 years old. I got it all figured out. I don't need you. You guys are stupid. I'm smarter than you, and I'm out of here. And you can't even pay for your own rent. You ain't yeah. got a car to drive, but apparently you're smarter than your parents, and you got it all figured out, yep. right? That's where we're at when we haven't decided to find someone that we can follow. You have to submit to someone, right? You've got to find someone that you can say, again, go listen to the Mentors podcast and find people that you can follow. But until you submit to someone, if you're just saying, like, I'm just going to figure it all out on my own, no one's good enough, I'm, I don't need anybody else, it's just me and my Bible, you're not really ready to learn and grow. God is going to put people in your life that can teach you. God's going to put people in your life that can disciple you. Yeah, and what that immature thought process will look like practically, these will be people who, like, the pastor said something I didn't like, so I'm leaving the church. Or, you know what, you did, like, there's certain, some things that people might uh, not be who they say they are, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that people are who they say they are, but you find out that, you know, there's something that they said to you that you didn't like, or, you know, you don't really agree with something about their life, and aka, you need them to be perfect. So you bring cancel culture thought process into your your discipleship thought process of like, oh, well, you know what, I just, I can't follow that person. It's like, so you're, you're only going to follow someone if they're perfect according to you, 
right? But but we they don't think through that logic. It's just like, oh, well, that person said this, and I just don't agree with that. So we're gonna go find another church because we just weren't, you know, we weren't getting fed here, or we weren't, we weren't getting. I'm what not we needed. saying that the people that are discipling you are perfect. No, they're they're, they're not going to be. That's they're part not, of the lesson. There will be, and, yes. and you know what? There there will be people that maybe you thought they were your discipler. And they do some things, and it's like that's not the right person to disciple right. me. Yes, right. And if you've if you've had to walk through that, you just need to find someone who can disciple you. Yeah. But don't get turned off by something you didn't like. Certainly, small stuff like they hurt my feelings. Right. Right. I promise you, whoever's discipling you, they're going to hurt your feelings, and most of the time, it's for your good. Yeah. And if someone's really discipling you with the heart of God, and they hurt your feelings, it may and it may have been unintentional, mm-hmm. and they weren't trying to do that. You got to get over those things. You may be, you may have someone who's discipling you. It's like, man, well, actually, I'm not sure if this person is of God or not. Then you need to find someone who can disciple you. But don't just think like, you know what? I don't really need anybody else. I'm gonna figure it out all by myself. And one of the great lessons for us as Christians for maturity, and I've, I've this has been a revelation to me at Elevate Life Church with us. And your dad has talked about it, and Pastor, I like, I've I've seen it modeled. Is what happens when you decide to plant yourself somewhere? Yeah. Because it's like in my marriage, divorce is not an option. Uh, like once once the the quitting option is off the table, guess what you have to do? You have to figure it out, right? And I understand that that's a big statement to say you're going to plant yourself somewhere. But like in a transient culture like we have now, where people move for jobs and all sorts of things, this seems like a real violation. But that's because similar to last week's podcast, our priorities are different, right? They're they're out of line. If your priority is the kingdom of God, you're not going to be saying where can I go make the most money? Where's the best job? You're going to be saying like where has God called us to be planted that's with right. other people to advance His kingdom in this area. And I'm not saying that that means that you, you know, anyways, I could go down a whole other thing, but I'm not going to. But I just think that there's a real lesson in having that thought process. So first is worship and sacrifice for God's way. Second is authority and fellowship. What's number three, G? So number three is, again, these are zones. So you go from worship, you go from worship to authority and fellowship, and then from authority and fellowship into relationship and intimacy, Mm. right? When someone is like, when you've chosen to follow someone, again, Jesus would preach all these messages, Right. And then he would invite people to follow him. Yeah. And few did. Yeah. Right. All the ones who followed him, they're the ones who actually hung out with Jesus, mm-hmm. who who ate multiple meals with him, who just sat around with him, spent time with him, got to ask him questions. Right. That's not everyone's not getting to do that of Jesus. But the ones who were truly following him to the places they wanted to go to and the places they were afraid to go to. Those are the people who really learn from him. And when you're at this stage, like, hey, man, I'll, fo- I'll follow you. I, I want to do what you're doing. That's the people that you can invite, in, invite into relationship with you. Or, if again, if this works both ways. People you're discipling, people that are discipling you, they invite you into relationship. And that's where intimacy starts to happen. And in that intimacy, right, that's where you can really see why they do what yeah. they do. You didn't, Jesus would preach the messages, but you didn't get to ask him questions. Mm-hmm. You didn't get to understand all the stuff that he was doing in his life. But only when you've chosen to follow him do you get to see the intimate things. Yeah. And the verse that goes well with this is John chapter 15, Verse 15, this is right after Jesus uh, washes the disciples' feet. And John, this is getting uh, closer to the, the time when this is getting close to the time when Jesus is going to be crucified. John uh, chapter 15, verse 15, he says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Mm. Right. So he's yeah. he's talking about the change in relationship. Yes. Yeah. And so because you've submitted to me, because mm-hmm. you're truly following me, I can reveal the things of the kingdom of, to you. This is the same, and I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the reference, uh, but this is the same where Jesus, you know, in the, the same time that it says, um, where Jesus goes to his hometown and he can't yes. do do many miracles. Yeah. It's not that Jesus couldn't do the miracles. Because people didn't believe in him because of the authority of who God is and because of the order of, of performing miracles, Jesus wasn't going to do those things. Right. In that same way, Jesus is saying, I can't reveal the kingdom to you until we have relationship. Mm-hmm. And again, that's why I talk about it Mighty Men all the time. Discipleship happens through relationship. Discipleship doesn't happen through you hearing a great message. That prompts you and prepares you for discipleship. Right. Right. But that's uh, true discipleship is going to happen through relationship. Yeah, and, and G, I, we're going to go to step four. Before we do, you said something so good in our preparation. You talked about how discipleship is tell them, show them, like they do Yeah, it. so look at it this way. Um, you know, in the 90s, we used to all wear these WWJD bracelets. What would Jesus do? Great. Right, right? and yeah. that, that's a great thought process. Um, let's expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Really, if you want to break discipleship down, number one, it's what did Jesus do? 
right? What right. did he do? Um, you had to have been there or you're reading about it for you to understand what he did. So this is scripture. I've got to read some scripture uh, to understand what Jesus did. Now to get into the real meat of it, the second part is why did he do it? Yes. Again, John chapter eight, yeah. the, the woman caught in adultery. Why didn't Jesus do what the law of Moses said? Mm -hmm. Right. I've got to get to the heart of why Jesus did what he did. But then step three, this is the real piece. This is where discipleship, this is where discipleship is leading us to. How do I do it? Yeah. This is what Jesus wanted for the disciples. You need to watch me do it. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about why I did it. And then I'll empower you to go do it. Yes. Right. And so how do I do it? This is also an understanding of where a great uh, discipler, someone who ideally is a mentor in your life. The people that I'm discipling, just let me, let me just talk practically about myself for an example. People that I'm discipling, I'm not trying to make them little Garrett's. Right. I'm not trying to make you be like me because you're different than me. Mm -hmm. God made you different than me. Yeah. We don't have the same. Uh, I love the way Pastor Keith talks about your divine fingerprint. You're one percent. From a DNA perspective, we're all 99% the same. Mm -hmm. But there's a 1% difference between me and anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so your 1% is not the same as mine. But who got, God doesn't change. Right. Even between our 1% differences. Yeah. So let me teach you all the things of God. Let me show you how God has showed up in my life. And I'm going to give that to you. And we'll watch how he shows up in your life. Yeah. He's going to use, I have different gifts and abilities than you. Right. It's great if someone else has the same gifts as me. Good. Maybe I can help you like one extra step. Yeah. But for everyone else that doesn't have the same, I can still disciple you. I can still show you what God's done in my life, how to act out what God's doing, really what the heart of God is. And then because you're someone, you're someone that I'm mentoring because I understand you well, that, and that's the key part, because I understand you well, let's look at how God's going to show up in your life. Yeah. Let's look at how you're going to display the glory of God. Because I can't, I can't be fully like Christ. Yeah. I'm like a tiny little piece of who Christ is. And every once in a while, I have like these, a glimmer of a moment that I, I'll look partially like Jesus. That's yeah. the truth for all of us. Yeah. Right? I can't fully be like him. I'm going to do the best that I can. And so for, with each of us, it's like, man, if I could just show you the glimmer of who Christ is in my life, let's see what that glimmer looks like in your life. We can't, we can't possess the glory that he has, but I'm going to do the best that I can. And I'm going to use the 1% that God's given me to show up in that way. Yeah. Right. So it's, what did Jesus do? Why did he do it? Then it's, how do I do it? Yeah. Right. And a mentor and a discipler is someone who can understand you and show you how the word of God is going to show up in your life and how you can be a great discipler of other people, how you can advance the kingdom on the earth. Yeah. And, and what Garrett just described that process is what is what you're listening to. Like is this podcast. I mean, you've discipled me so much of, over the over the years and so much of what I'm now seeing as God's goodness and his glory showing up in my own life, like you said, is in the one percent that I have that you don't. For sure. And what's amazing about God is you sow a cup and you reap a bushel. Right. So whatever you sow, you reap way more. And so for the joy of what we're doing is that I get to bring my 1%. You obviously have discipled me quite a bit and you have your 1%. And it, it's one and one equals three. And that's God math. And it's just, it's a wonderful thing to experience. Um, and also to that point you talked about, G, where it's, it's show them, uh, teach, show them, or tell them, show them, and then they go do it. I mean, think about before this John 15, 15 scripture when he's now saying, hey, your friends, this is after he's already sent them out two by two and given them authority to go out. This, he sent out the 70, right, to go to town to town, heal, like preach repentance and heal them of all their sins and, and uh, cast out demons. And then he, they come back and they kind of feed back to Jesus what happened to them and they're all excited. It's almost like the test run, like, okay, you've been seeing all this stuff. Now I'm going to send you out. We're going to like, we're going to take the training wheels off and let you have a, you know, start to ride around a little bit. And so it's, I, it, you can miss those moments in the Bible, but like Jesus was so intentionally developing these people because he knew exactly what was going to happen. And so that leads us up to the, the pinnacle of when you know your disciple, which is step four, right? Which is Yeah, the, you're talking about God math, right? That's right. right. God math, one plus one equals three. God's version of discipleship is very different than, uh, or God's version of multiplication is very different than man's version of addition, right? And again, this is an unfortunate, so I wouldn't even say it's an indictment. It's just where the church has gotten to that's not working, mm -hmm. right? God, our way doesn't work. God's way works really well. Our way has been like, let's just get a bunch of people saved as quickly as we can. And you know what that does? It does not multiply, right? We can subtract faster than we can add but you can't subtract faster than God can multiply. Right. And that's man's way of doing it versus God's way of doing it. And what I mean by that, Jesus's way of discipleship was, I'm, a, I'm just going to invest real hard in 12 people. Yeah. Right. And what they'll do is those 12, those 12 people, they'll become 144 people mm -hmm. and it'll multiply and it'll multiply and it'll multiply. And that expands so much greater 
than, you know, well, I'm going to preach a message over here. I'm going to preach a message over here. I'm going to get all these people to pray a prayer because those people don't multiply. Right. Right. So if you can just pour yourself into a few people and that continues to happen, because uh, ideally, here's like if you just kind of break that part down, if you get people saved, not only are they not multiplying, some of those people subtract themselves. Right. Right. They stray from the way. Mm-hmm. If you'll pour deeply into a few people, not only will they multiply, they won't subtract. Right. Because you brought them to completion. Yeah. Right. You help them really walk through the process of transformation and God really developed them. So the scripture that goes on with this, this is uh, verse 19, right? We're going through this process from 16, 17 to 18. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always and to the end of the age. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus didn't say, go and get them to make a prayer. He says, go therefore and make disciples. So multiplication is this powerful, the reason I call it multiplication, I love this scripture. This is, I think, a great representation of the power of multiplication of really where discipleship gets to Luke chapter six, verse 39 through 40. We could have used this scripture at the beginning of this podcast with what we were talking about. I wanted to use it here at the end. Verse 39, Luke chapter six, verse 39, Jesus says, he also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? Right? That's you trying to disciple yourself, right? You need someone Mm -hmm. who's not blind to help you. Right? Will they not both fall into a pit? Verse 40. The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. Or in another translation, the student is not greater than the master, but the student can do everything the mm-hmm. master can do. And this is really where multiplication gets yeah. us, to, or this is where discipleship gets us to. Like Jesus said, right? The poor will always be among you, but I won't always be. Yeah. Right? One day you'll do everything that I did. And Jesus even actually said, you'll do even greater things than I did which is a, a scary and challenging statement. And this is what you should believe for all the people that you're discipling. I've got a group of men that I, that I spend time discipling, and I've told them, I want you guys to go further than me. I'm, trying to, I'm just giving you all that I can give you of, of what God's given me, what my mentors and my disciples have poured into me, and I'm going to give as much as that as I can to you because you're supposed to go further than me. A student needs to go further than, is, needs to go to the level of the master, right? And that pours into each generation after you and the next people mm-hmm. after you. That's really the power of discipleship is in multiplication where man's version of addition is like, well, let me just give you a piece of me and I'll give you a piece of me. Really the heart of this is you got to have people who are fully understanding of the authority of God, but also understanding of the role that they play. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's a vulnerable, honestly, it's a vulnerable role to walk in as a leader. And there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that where people are looking to me and saying like, I need to do what Garrett does, but it's not the Garrett show. Right. Right. That's a vulnerable role to walk in like as a leader and saying like, look, it's really all about God. I want you guys Mm -hmm. to follow me, but you're not worshiping me. You're worshiping God. Yeah. Right. And so that's a lot of responsibility on any person's behalf. You got to find people that you can follow and then you got to be someone that's worthy of following. Raise up the people behind you. Give them everything that God has given you and more so that they can become great disciples. Man, that, that's so good, G. And I'm imagining there's people out there that are listening to this that are like, man, I want that. I want to be discipled, and so I need to find that person. And I want I want to, because you know, we're in the modern times, we're in the modern day era, I want you to share like about your own experience of discipleship, right? Because you talked about there's Paul's, there's Barnabas's, and, and just what that's looked like for you. Yeah, I think great question. Some, so yeah. a lot of people think like discipleship is learning... Um, is like how to pull apart scripture and things like that, or like getting a, a apologetic education and stuff like that. I got a lot of that from private school. Um, I got a lot of that from some of my own study, my own desire. Some of the right people directed me, hey, read this book. Hey, go learn about this stuff. Hearing some messages that helped develop my biblical education. But I, I noticed I didn't put that, like Jesus also didn't spend time tearing apart the scripture with the disciples either. What he did for them was model really well. Right. Right, I've got two men who like were a lot of the relationship and intimacy portion of discipleship for me. Um, they modeled it really well. My dad and Pastor Keith were the people that, like in my life, they sh- they modeled what Scripture looks like. I watched my dad like deal with really difficult circumstances, 
people cheat on him, people lie to him, and the way that he treated them. Like, man, that's an example of what scripture. I watched Pastor Keith do the same thing. Like, not only did I hear so many great messages from him, but I had the opportunity because of him and my dad's relationship and my relationship with Josh, I got to see a lot of who Pastor Keith was like on the inside in an intimate way and watch him deal with things, watch him deeply care for people. And again, that was like a lot of the modeling for me of scripture. And then I have another mentor, his name's Phil, who's spoken a lot into my life, who will look at scripture together. He's both a mentor and a discipler for me. And so I've had different like disciplers and it's like you can have more than one. That's great to have more than one because I got mentors and all these different ways. And, and it's a great situation uh, for me. This is ideally what I would want for anyone else, that anyone that's mentoring you is also someone who's worthy of discipling you. Right. By my own definition of mentor, you have to be able to disciple me if you're going to mentor me. Right. Uh, you know, I don't have people who are like just a business mentor for right. me. Um, and maybe that, maybe I'm not saying I won't. Like maybe that time will come for me in my life. I'll have a, you know, a guy who's just like a business mentor for real estate or something like that. Right. Uh, but the people who have discipled me, it's really been the people that I've had deep relationship with. And so this like, what this in, invites us into is an interesting conversation around like, who are you really learning from? Yeah. Right. Cause like that it's, it's going back to the mentorship podcast, mm -hmm. find the people who like, you'll just do what they say, just like a discipler, right? Like find a mentor, the people that they give you a recommendation. They say you should do this and you say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Right. And if they live by the word of God, that means they're discipling you. They're not just discipling you and Hey, let me like help you memorize scripture. They're discipling you by saying, here's how you should live. Yeah. No, that's so good. G. Well, I, I hope that that's helped everybody. Can you touch as well on the difference, though, between the Pauls and Barnes's before we wrap up? Because oh, yeah, I think yeah. that's worth you mentioning. One, one other thing. So I've also got people in my life uh, that are like a Barnabas for me. I have some friends who are pastors. I have some friends who have like deep biblical education. And there's certain people that like when I want to pick a part of scripture, I'll call my I'll call my friend. I'll be like, hey, man, what like pull, can we look at this? Where What's your take on this? Am I reading this right? I'll also ask them about a situation. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to deal with this situation in this way in accordance with what scripture says. These are the scriptures I'm looking at in this situation. Am I looking at this rightly? Um, and they're not necessarily like disciples for me, but because they're Barnabases in my life, they help me wrestle with it. Right. Right. And I'm also what I'm, what I'm also getting is because these people are Barnabases for me, they have different mentors than I do. I trust them. And so I'm getting access to all the people that have discipled them as well. Yeah. I mean, that, that really is the multiplication, isn't it? Yeah. Is that because you, what you honor, you have access to. That's so good. All right. Well, any last thoughts on, on discipleship, G? Go and make disciples. That's, uh, hey, you're quoting Jesus now. That's good company. <laughs>